Awesome. Thanks, Pam and Mace and Jason and everybody else who helps make this happen. How's my sound? Okay. So uh, my name is Lopin Chandra. I'm zooming in from Ohlone Chichenyo land here, otherwise known as Berkeley, Berserkley. <laughs> I've crossed the bay from a lot of you. And it's nice to see some, actually I'm seeing some old familiar faces, not old faces, just familiar faces that I haven't seen in a while. It's good to see you all. And uh, so what I'd like to do tonight is start with a sit. And a long time ago, I mentioned that from time to time, I like to have us sit a little longer than we normally do. Normally we sit for about 30 minutes. Tonight we'll sit for 45 minutes in the spirit of um, Charlotte uh, Joko Beck's uh, advice every once in a while, prolong your meditation sit by 10, 15 minutes, see how that feels. So we're going to do that tonight. So please go ahead and make sure you are in a comfortable position, whether it's seated upright on a chair, a couch, a uh, cushion on the floor, whatever it is, just find your happy place. Uh, also lying down in the supine position is a completely viable meditative pose, uh, one that I use quite often. So lying down with a pillow under your head, maybe some a pillow or a rolled up blanket under your knees to support the low back. Nothing wrong with being comfortable in meditation. The trick if you're lying down to not fall asleep is to have one, uh, forearm, one forearm perpendicular to the floor with the hand relaxed. And then if you fall asleep, it'll just flop down to the floor and wake you up. And as my teacher says, Alan Wallace often says, look, if you fall asleep during meditation, it means you need, needed a nap. <laughs> Don't beat yourself up about it. You can take a nap and then meditate after or later when you're more crisp. Now, having said that, I also like to say, and as does Alan and other teachers say, it's important when you're meditating to try to have as much wakefulness and clarity as possible so that you're cultivating qualities of wakefulness and clarity, not dullness and spaced outness, because we can cultivate those qualities as well, and that is less optimal. <laughs> so, you know, be clear. If you're tired, let yourself just let go. If you feel like you've got it, even if you're a little tired, but all it takes is a few breaths to get you over the hump. I think a lot of you, like me, have found that in the beginning I have a sit, sometimes I feel um, too tired. But the, the beauty of, of uh, grounded, relaxed, authentic meditation practice is that it is rejuvenating. It is restorative. So let it be restful for you. Notice if you hold tightness or bring any kind of um, pushing energy to your practice and let yourself unravel that, unwind at the end of a busy day, probably for most of us. So now that we're settled in, please uh, allow your eyes to close. And begin by taking a few nice deep breaths luxuriating in the deep in-breath and the release of the slow, freeing out-breath. Noticing if you're holding tension in the face or the shoulders, the back, the belly, the hips, and so on. Kind of scan the body and release as much as you can with each out-breath. Feel the upper jaw release, the lower jaw slacken. It's almost as if the muscles of the face are melting off the bones. Chin drawing in slightly towards the center of the throat, lengthening the back of the neck. Shoulders relaxed, the tip of the tongue resting at the upper palate, just at the root of the top front teeth. Chest is buoyant, the spine is nice and tall. Feel that elongation through the vertebrae. The belly soft, supple. 
The hips comfortable at ease, the legs in a comfortable position, feet on the floor in any shape that feels good for you or crossed on your cushion. Let's take a moment to remember our motivation for our practice, for our spiritual life, whatever that is for you. Maybe speaking aloud or internally, your prayer, your intention. And if you haven't already, include the phrase for the benefit of all beings. Recognizing that as we cultivate an inner sense of balance and knowing and clarity and peace that ripples out and brings benefit in ways seen and unseen. Now, feeling the breath again anew within you, maybe a little release so that the breath is more of a natural flow. A helpful image that I bring about quite often is the image of a sleeping baby. If you've ever watched a baby sleeping in its bed or crib, it's such a beautiful sight to behold, this natural breath, so full-bodied and at ease. It's total surrender. There's no pushing. You don't feel any subtle energy of the ego. Just unwinding, letting go, like the grip is releasing. Right out of the gate is a way to bring about a sense of clarity and focused concentration within the space, the field of relaxation. We'll spend some time at your own pace, mindfully attending to the breath for 21 rounds of the breath at your own pace. The top of the in-breath and internal count one, and then breathing out. Just attending to the sensations of the breath as it moves in and out of the body. At the end of the second in-breath, count two and so on. Quiet, a light touch. The main focus is the sensation of the full cycle of the in and the out breath. Practice in silence. Releasing distraction, staying with the breath.
Just a light release of the counting, but maintain this quality of awareness, of the full flow of the in-breath and the out-breath. Noticing when distraction has pulled you away. If you wish, you can label it, thought or distraction, whatever you wish. And gently, with love, bring back your awareness like you would a, a wandering child. Come back. Put your awareness in your lap and flow with the breath in and out. Develop the pleasure of the focused mind. Yes, that's a carrot. Exert a little effort, but without tension. Stay in the moment. And we'll sit in silence for a while longer. Tending to the sensations of the breath. <clears throat> remembering. The sati is remembering to come back again and again to this present moment in the body with the breath. A little tinge of enjoyment. Let yourself feel that.
If you're cruising, just let my words wash over you. If you're having difficulty, a little trick, a little help for the distracted mind is to actually recite a simple mantra. Bhuto. Awake. Or sometimes awakened one. In any case, the bu is at the in-breath, the do is the out-breath. Internalize the sound, bu, inhale, do, exhale, and let that come, bring you back to that wakeful state of clarity, luminosity within a relaxed, spacious feeling of presence in the moment, bu, do, bu, do, with each breath.
Now skipping a breath, stay, stay in this ocean of presence and recognize that in fact, every breath is a tonglen, descending outward, receiving inward to yourself, to the world. It's natural, tonglen is happening all the time. And that extension out into every breath is lojong. Every breath is a mind training. In fact, you've been practicing all along 24 hours a day without knowing the beauty that's always happening. within you and all around you. And let's step more fully into that dimension of Tonglen. It's like if we're on a journey, we're taking a step deeper into the sacred space of Tonglen, sending and receiving beginning with ourselves. We'll take a step further and more intentionality. The breath remains the same, a nice natural mindful breath. And we can feel that beating heart at the center of the chest. And just next to it is the heart chakra, that center of the sternum. And feel that as a pulsing orb of light, your life force, really the portal to the open infinite space. I feel this is like the sun, orb of light at the heart. And each breath is feeding with oxygen, the in-breath invigorating the heart space, this orb of light at the heart chakra aerating it, and the out-breath is softening any tension or resistance or tightness around the heart space. This basic level of self tonglen, breathing in and breathing out through the heart. Remembering that that portal, that heart luminosity is your Buddha nature, it is the Atman, it is the spark of luminosity within all of us. God, however you want to call it, goddess. It's our divinity. And that is undying and cannot be harmed. So as we breathe in, we can have the courage to breathe in any hardship, perhaps in our emotional, physical field or mental field, pain or any kind of suffering you might be holding or carrying with you. Invite it with the in-breath into that heart space. Let it be, let it come home. And then with the out-breath, release any resistance to that. Release the grip, the judgment the resistance, the anger. Inhale, bringing it in again. With each breath, you're breathing in, presencing and coming home to the heart and breathing out, softening and opening and circulating and letting the so-called poison be transmuted into medicine. The inhale is then the poison, bringing it into the heart, transmuting it through that luminosity and then breathing out, letting it transform and become your energy field, your life force, nectar. And be specific, maybe you have resistance towards somebody. Maybe you've just been injured in some way. Maybe you've been carrying something for a long time. Feel it, breathe it in with the in-breath and aerate it, transform it, and release with the opera. Let's practice in silence for a bit.
And then naturally in your own time, the next step is to move deeper into practicing for others. So let your mind roam to a friend, a family member, or even a so-called enemy if you feel capacitated to work with a challenging person. In any respect, whoever you work with, bring them to mind as clearly as possible in your mind's eye in front of you, remembering how they looked the last time you saw them. See them there, make contact with their eyes, and see any hardship, any suffering, confusion, delusion that they might be holding or carrying surrounding them like a cloud. And with the in-breath, draw in that smoky vapor into that luminous orb of light at your heart. Transform it just like you were with your own hardship. And then send out with the out-breath a cool clearing energy. Sending is the tong of sending, of healing, of well wishes. The inhale is the len, the taking in transforming and then sending out. Stay with the rhythm of the breath, the natural breath. With each breath, the darkness, the smog, fog around them is clearing and they become lighter, more capacitated within their own being, more he healthy. Let your imagination inform you here. Trust yourself. Stay with the present moment with the breath. You wish you can roam to another person, taking your time as you wish. You're in groups of people, animals, countries, communities. We inhale as we have the courage, at least in our prayer time, the aspiration to inhale and help relieve the suffering of this being or beings, transforming it at that immutable heart space, and then sending out a healing remedy, wishing them well. 
and may they also awaken to their Buddha nature, their true nature. Be free of suffering. For the last few minutes now, let's shift into, when you're ready, a different vantage point. Imagine now, as our journey unfolds, that you travel to the moon and you're sitting on the moon practicing your Donglen and looking down from the moon, from the vantage point, looking at our beautiful earth and feeling intuitively, sensing the beauty and also the tragedy of all of the stories, the lives, the karmas upon this planet Earth. And with this great capacity of your heart, Matonglen, develop a sincere wish to help relieve the world of its suffering, the beings on it, the world, the elements, all of it. And through that wish, then you inhale and feel like a smoky vapor, breathing the suffering of the world into your luminous, infinite heart space, transforming it and breathing out a cool wind, clearing that suffering, clearing darkness, bringing healing, light, balance, whatever people need with the out breath, the remedy. Breathing in, drawing in the suffering into this orb of light at your heart. Transform and breathe out the healing remedy. Sincere wish, may you be well and free of suffering. And continue like this.
Now we'll conclude with some another form of meditation of mantra. Uh, mantra Om Mani Padme Hum, which means Om, jewel in the heart of the lotus. Hum, which is like it seals the mantra. The Om is the universal sound of consciousness. Mani is jewel. Padme is in the Padma, in the lotus. Hum. Closure. Like an exclamation point. You can follow along with me singing in a meditative way, not projecting in an operatic way, just more of a felt vibratory meditative recitation with some a beautiful melody common in Tibet. This is the mantra of compassion of the great Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara or Chenrezig in Tibetan. His Holiness the Dalai Lama is said to be an emanation of this Avalokiteshvara. Buddha of compassion. And let this come from your heart as a continuation of the Thonglen for the world. Oh, Mani Padme Ho, oh, 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 Mani Padme Ho, oh, oh, Mani Padme Ho, oh, oh, Mani Padme Ho. Oh, oh, O Mani Padme Ho, 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 O Mani Padme Ho. O Mani Padme Ho, 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 O Mani Padme Ho. O Mani Padme Hum, 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 O Mani Padme Hum. O Mani Padme Ho, O Mani Padme Ho, O Mani Padme Ho, O Mani Padme Ho, O Mani Padme Ho. Thank you. Slowly begin to come out, come back to our room together. I hope you enjoyed the slightly longer sit and felt some benefit from that. It's um, It does allow it more time to kind of drop drop, 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 drop in, 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 and then you, you feel the benefit in a way that we don't always get to feel with shorter sits. Hopefully that's what happens. Sometimes that's not what happens and that's okay too. You know, it's all a process of purification, right? It's in terms of purifying the spinning of the mind from our day, from our life, from our lifetimes. And often for me, what I've experienced in retreat or my daily practice is there just needs to be allotted a gentle time to unravel without too much judgment or forcing of anything to happen. Sometimes we just need to unravel for a while, right? Is that true for you too? Yeah. 
Oh, this two dimensional Zoom room is getting really old. <laughs> I can't hear you. I can't feel you. I, it's so quiet over here. Why don't you, anyone have any questions, comments? Oh, good. Thanks, Denise. A little, a little blip from the ether sphere. <laughs> Um, oh, you wanted it to continue. Reminds you how weak I have let my back become. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Where are you, Denise? <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, sometimes the backache is very distracting. And uh, that's why the supine position is nice. And then in between practices, some yoga, some Pilates, some running, some surfing, whatever you do to stay strong and active. I like to walk. I'm a walker and a yogi. Those are my two happy places. Um, swimming is also so good for the body. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you lay down. Good. Let yourself lie down and unravel. <laughs> right. And then you didn't want it to end. And the hand up, that was manageable, right? You can you don't have to exert too much effort if you're aligned with gravity. You know, it's not distracting. Yes, good. Okay. Anyone else? Any voices want to come through? I have a question. Five minutes. Yeah. Uh huh. Is that Lindsay? Hi, yeah, Lindsay. Hi. Hi. Um, this is something I've dealt with on and off for a long time in my practice, but I'm, however, I used to deal with it, I've forgotten. I forgot what was helpful for me, but I noticed that um, when I first start breathing and especially when I'm given sort of guidance around how to breathe, what I notice most is my constriction. Mm -hmm. And it becomes like, I, I start to feel like, oh, I'm not able to take a deep breath. And it's like, I'm not sure. It doesn't seem to correspond to actual like anxiety I have in my day. It seems just like a, a focus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I, then I'm conscious of, <laughs> I don't want to be in a space where I'm trying to like beat my body into submission and be like, just breathe, breathe deeper. Um, so do you have thoughts about how yeah. to? Yeah. Great question. I used to have that too. I'd get, yeah, it, it, there's something about the focus. Sometimes when we bring focus to something that we normally don't think about is just so natural, it can cause that a little bit more. Uh, constriction and um, I found that meditating lying down helped me let go of that just letting go because the apparatus the breathing apparatus is so much more accessible like like at ease and just the the limbic response we have from lying down is a restful relaxed way so you might want to train up it maybe start your practice lying down get the breath in a nice flowing way and then you could sit up if you prefer to sit up and see if you can carry that with you. That's what I had to do. I had to just meditate lying down and find that again. I would get tight in my belly. Um, yeah, yeah it, it wasn't necessarily because of a thought of anxiety. It was more of that feeling like you described of just bringing my focus to it. And suddenly it's a little bit too um, palpable or too under the microscope or something. Uh, so I hope that that's helpful. Um, the other thing, you know, I had a, <laughs> I remember one of the first, you know, as a young Dharma teacher, I, I think it was my first retreat. <laughs> I had a, a, a man who had been studying with me in another context in like a weekly class, but he, um, he would get in meditation and he would do this heavy breathing. Like suddenly, like the, the guy with the normal he, daily breath was fine, but he would turn into this you know, approach of, and, and the whole room would fill with his breath sound. And I knew it was distracting people. It was pretty over the top. I'm not exaggerating. It was even louder than what I was doing. And I found, you know, I was, I tried to instruct in the class, you know, relax the breath. I, he wasn't going in. I don't think he was hearing me. <laughs> So afterwards, I pulled him aside and I said, you know, I, I want to encourage you to find that natural breath, like, like the breath that you use throughout your day or, or sleeping, or why don't you, like, when you sit down to meditate, it might be helpful to feel like you're sitting across a dinner table with your favorite friend 
or your loved one that you're just so relaxed and natural with. And remember, like, how do you breathe? How do you feel when you're sitting across the table with that person? And just bring that breath to your meditation. And it, it helped him. The next class, he was chill. He wasn't doing this unconscious pranayama, <laughs> hyperventilating. So it's also kind of like, a, how do you feel cool and calm? Like, how do you bring that in? Whatever trick helps you. That's really helpful. Thank you so much. Because it just Good. feels like then it, I get in a loop and it mm -hmm. it, it loops itself every yeah. time. And you don't want to you don't want to retrain it. You don't want to retrace that loop too much. You know, so let yourself lie down. I would say just lie down for a while. See how that feels. Or if, or if that image or a similar image helps you. But the lying down for me was huge. Good. Good. Le Le Leanne, yes. Um. Hi, it's been. Hi, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't been back yeah. in well since before the summer, so this is really lovely and necessary. Oh, welcome back. Thank you. Um, I so I've just moved, and um, I could show you the boxes everywhere. And it's uh, setting up a new apartment from scratch. It's no small thing. And what I've been experiencing, I mean, everything's just derailed, like no routine, etc. And I've become I guess like my obsessive OCD tendencies that are well-placed when they're working an artistic project has been instead transmuted to like Amazon shopping for the right toilet stand for the bathroom. I literally spent like four hours last night till 3 a.m. looking for chairs. And I'm bringing this up because I'm like watching my mind. It feels like I am just along for this ride and my mind is like out of control and there's like an addiction like I'm I've there's like some I'm feeling these neural pathways and I like will step away and lie down or go for a walk and like still I'm just like planning where the plant goes blah, blah, blah. and I guess my question is and so and I've fallen off of my practice and everything and it's like how this is helpful where to find your way back with like one step but in and I've certainly thought about the mindfulness of like okay and there's been moments of separate take a breath like try and rewire but it's so far that even in the I'll have you know 30 seconds of it and then I'm just gone again and mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. starting to not be cute it's like been a couple of weeks and I'm concerned for like my dad has Alzheimer's now and I'm like I'm this I'm certainly on the path and so I just <laughs> wonder like how do you, when you really are watching your mind, like do crazy things and are aware that like neural pathways need to be rewired. And yet like the simple act of focusing on your breath feels like you're, it's not enough. What, how do I find the way back <laughs> and liberate myself from this situation? <laughs> Do you do yoga or qigong? Do you have any a different kind of phys physical meditative practice you could lean on? Yeah, yoga. I I started going twice a week, so that definitely helps. It's like the fine. You can roll your mat out at home and do it at home. Like make your little island of sanity at home. Even in the middle of those boxes, roll your mat out and and designate that as your space. And just do three sun salutes, just or whatever. Don't just and breathe and bring your mindfulness to the breath. Because what my sense is is that because of experience too, for me is that um, moving unsettles the prana. You know, moving is destabilizing for your your body and your mind. So the body, the breath, and then the subtle energy, the prana, the winds, like the circulatory system influence the mind so in a way it's like because you're you're kind of hovering in a kind of a a loop or spinning out right this feeling of ungrounded spin out the mind might not be able to be the one to bring it back right so come coming at that issue from a different angle through your body coordinating your movement with your breath that is shamatha right that's the Buddha said, practice mindfulness in the four body postures. Basically, that was shorthand for like your whole day, like everything you're doing. He said, sitting, standing, 
lying and walking, but really like yoga is a form of walking, you know? So, okay, so here, that's, that's my piece is do it through your body. Cause I can tell you've got your, your, you've got a good dynamism in your body. You know, you're an embodied artist type. So, so find your, and, and yoga can bring us down to the grounded balance place. And don't think you have to go out to a class. Don't do that. I mean, you could do that, but just do three sun salutes and a couple seated postures, then lie down. It's all you need to do. Okay, part two. I just had this feeling that get this book, Food for the Heart. It's a book I recommended a few weeks ago. It's a book that I used on my retreat that I would listen to, get the audio book or another Dharma book that you like, but like a practice, like a essence direct teaching you know and put it in your earbuds or in your speaker as you're unpacking like let that saturate your your moving and your unpacking and your shopping online and all of that so that you've got you need some support right now you know and that will help create it will buttress you it will but you can't do it alone man you know this is hard moving is really hard <laughs> yeah Thank you. Yeah, so get, get some wisdom coming in through the ear sense, the ear sense faculty with the, the Ajahn Chah. It's his oral teachings to his students written down by people like Jack Cornfield and so on. And food for the heart is just that that locked me in when I was in retreat, feeling alone, feeling totally fed up with my monkey mind. Like <laughs> this is, you know, dire. <laughs> Um, and I really, I really benefited from that and it really inspired me and helped me find my ground again. We all have a crazy, you know, we're all nuts. <laughs> Maybe that's too flippant to say it like that, but you know, we're all addicted. Like you said, you're not the only one. We are all addicted. And it's like, when we start really meditating and looking at it, it's, we think it's getting worse or we think we're so horrible, but actually it's the natural habitual state of all of us through lifetimes if not just this life so but that's okay you don't have to overthink that you know the moment is what you've got liberate in the moment natural liberation of the thought i'm afraid of alzheimer's i'm going crazy whatever you come comes into your mind see that as a thought oh that's just a thought thank you oh it's not real like a cloud in the sky well, clouds are real, but they're also not what we think they are. <laughs> they look like a puffy thing up there, but really, I mean, when you get in a cloud, <laughs> it's different than what it looks like from afar. Thoughts are the same way. They're empty of solidity. So don't believe your fear. Don't believe all that. You're, you're young. I've got Alzheimer's in my family too, and I'm... <laughs> I have to say, I'm a little nervous about it. Now I'm in grad school in part because I want my mind to stay sharp. And of all things, I'm studying Sanskrit, which is like computer science for language. <laughs> it's basically uh, Latin, but in a different alphabet. <laughs> we have eight declensions. Wow. Every noun and verb has eight different versions and you have to memorize those. So. You know, I'm doing my best, but um, I see it as dementia prevention. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So keep, keep engaged. Keep yourself stimulated with some good Dharma audiobooks. Let that hold you and embrace you, buttress you. Okay, good. All right. So we are on slogan. I think that's all. Is there anything else? No one's got their hand raised. So I can move on if that's okay. All right. So we're nearing the end. There are 59 slogans. And we have in this particular matrix of slogans, there are different mind training systems. But in this system of the Chekawa Yeshe Dorje, who wrote the seven point mind training text, there are seven main header points. And there, uh, within those headers, like chapters, are many one-liner slogans, right? So tonight we're on slogan number 56. Each night we, we try to address one or two. 
And so what I wanted to say, I don't know if Eve mentioned this last week, she's on retreat, so I wasn't able to check in with her about what she shared last week. Um, but whether or not she shared with you, maybe there's some new people here. We're already thinking about what we're going to do next. And sometimes we do book studies, sometimes we do Lo Jong. Well, I am thrilled that she agreed to do a book that I love, that I've read many times before, called On the Path to Enlightenment, Heart Advice from the Great Tibetan Masters, uh, edited by Matthew Ricard. So when we're done with the slogans, we're going to start going through this book. And this is also Lojong. So basically all Dharma is Lojong, okay? All Dharma is mind training. And this is actually also called Lojong because what he's done is he's mined some of the greatest teachings and the greatest quotes from the greatest teachers from all the different schools of Tibetan Buddhism and consolidated them in this amazing book that goes through the mind training system from a from a different angle, which is more like the nundro. In nundro in Tibetan means the preliminary practices, like what goes before. And it's like supposed to, they are the mind training practices that you do before you get the, the kind of so-called more esoteric or subtle teachings of Dzogchen, Mahamudra. So but it's all in here, even the deepest of the essence of the Mahamudra and Dzogchen is in every page here. You know, it's not like it's boring. Nundro is not boring. Nundro is deep. And basically, this, the Tibetan tradition for the most part is brilliant because what it does is it has the fruit within the seed. That every seed hints to or speaks to in some way the fruition. It takes the fruition as the path which is Buddha nature. You're, you'll understand that as time goes on. If that went over your head, don't worry about it. It's, it's, it's just, it's exquisite. So if you don't have this book yet, you might wanna order it or check it out at the library. And I'm a big audiobook fan because I'm a mom and I'm so busy. I wouldn't read anything really if I wasn't able to listen to some stuff. So, you know, I'm reading more and more now my kids are a little older. But I really rely on audiobooks. And the audiobook of this is read by a man with a beautiful voice. And I've listened to it like five times over. I let it talk me to sleep at night. I let it talk to me on road trips uh, while I'm taking walks. I have my favorite chapters. So if you can, get the audiobook as well, get both or just one. So we'll probably start this in a few weeks. You know, we're on slogan 56 tonight, and uh, it's a simple slogan, it won't take long. And then we'll have a few more weeks, and we'll conclude. Hopefully, we'll have even I can teach together and conclude the last class, and then we'll pick up this book, okay? On the Path to Enlightenment, edited by Matthew Ricard, beautiful man, monk, great scholar. Book and translator. So tonight what we're doing is uh, a slogan that has two, at first glance, very different translations in different texts. Um, it's don't wallow in self-pity is the one that we have in the main root text that we're working with of Chogyam Trungpa. Don't wallow in self-pity. I'm going to put that in the chat just in case you wanted to drop in even deeper. But the other, slow, the other um, translation is interesting. It's quite different, is don't be boastful, like don't brag. So we're gonna talk about why, how it could be both of these. This is number 56. And these, are, these final slogans are all advice for life, you know, not on the cushion necessarily, but more about like you're living your life. How do you bring lojong and mind training into your life? So don't wallow in self-pity. Now, sometimes Chogyam Trungpa, who was so, he was such a renegade. <laughs> he was an iconoclast. Um, he, he does from time to time take creative license because I trust that he really understands 
the Tibetan in a way that others might not. But the literal Tibetan is Yu Magong. Yu Magong. And Yu means to boast or to brag. But it can also be to be uh, translated as to be distraught. So maybe that's where he's getting the self-pity. Like, don't fret about your life. Don't pity yourself. Don't be distraught. Magom. Magom is, is a very common phrase. Gom it alone means to meditate, to cultivate. In Sanskrit, it's bhavana, to familiarize, to cultivate, to meditate, bhavana. Tibetan is gom, G-O-M. Magom means don't familiarize, don't cultivate, don't meditate. So literally, you could translate this as like, don't, don't cultivate bragging, you know, don't cultivate that quality or don't habituate yourself in egoic um, boasting or on the other hand don't kind of habituate or like he's saying wallow Chogyam Trungpa said don't wallow which is a total loose translation of gom never would you see gom being translated as wallow and then in self-pity maybe that's you in some strange interpretation so first I'm going to talk about the don't be boastful one and then I'm going to talk about don't wallow in self-pity. Another nice translation by Zigar Kongtul Rinpoche is don't feel the world owes you. It's so interesting how different teachers have different interpretations. Um, don't wallow or don't feel the world owes you. So that's more in line with, um, well, it's in line with both of those in a way, isn't it? Because when we brag in a way, we kind of think that you know, the world owes us something or owes us respect. But when we're wallowing in self-pity, it's also another way of feeling that the world owes us or we're cheated out of our right to have this or that. So all of these overlap. So you can decide which one works best for you. But going off of this, this, this I think, lovely phrase, don't feel the world owes you. Um, as a Lojong practitioner, right, as somebody who's committed to the path of waking up and being a benefit in the world, who wants to train, who understands that the mind is an important thing to train and is committed to mindfulness and wisdom and compassion. As a Lojong practitioner who's training in letting go of our small sense of self, the isolated, egoic, <gasps> little me, mini me, um, and then serving others through our actions, through our words, through our thoughts and deeds. What Zigar Kongtrol says is to be careful not to think that people in your life owe you something just because you're being righteous or good or, you know, it's, you give something, be careful not to expect something in return, right? we do oh they didn't say thank you <laughs> sometimes that really bothers me right of course it's polite to say thank you and people should say thank you but at the same time give and let it go yeah it's like arjuna with the arrow bow and arrow in the mahabharata epic of indian lore uh, Krishna says, when you let go of that arrow, you have to let go of any investment or attachment to the outcome of where that arrow goes. You no longer have the arrow. So in this way, like you give or you do something, don't think that the world owes you something in return. Nothing is guaranteed. And you know, that payback might come in ways that we could never foresee anyway. So just let it go and see what comes back when it comes back, if at all. So what Zigar Kontrol says is be careful not to get puffed up and think, oh, I'm so special because I'm a Dharma practitioner. Oh, I've got this mala around my neck. Don't I look like a holy person? You know, like, don't do that. You know, like the Lojong practitioner is down on the down low. It's not performative. <laughs> if anything, you know, we, we want to fly under the radar and let the magic happen, you know. 
So Ziggur Control says shifting our affection from our ego to other beings will ultimately free us from all the sufferings of samsara. Maybe I'll just paste that. I like the way he worded that. Shifting our affection from our ego, because normally we're very affectionate towards it. I mean, also some of us aren't so affectionate towards our ego, and that's a whole nother story. But this kind of, even like self berating is a form of ego fixation, <laughs> you know? It's still kind of like a self um, absorption. It's a painful one, but it still is self-centered in a way. I mean, I'm not shaming it. It's just funny, actually. It's um, deceptive. It's a sneakier self-absorption. So he says, shifting our affection, you could say, or our absorption onto our ego, to other, instead to other beings will ultimately free us from all sufferings of some star. That's Lo Zhong in a nutshell. Minimizing all our self-cherishing, and maximizing other cherishing. That's our one-liner elevator speech. If somebody says, what is Lojong? Okay, does everybody have that? If I don't teach you anything else in these years of Lojong, that's all I want you to remember. I will feel I've done my job. Increasing cherishing of others and care and compassion, that beautiful heart that just flows so naturally it doesn't take effort once that dam is broken and it's blissful it's joyful it gets rewarding in the most profound sense it's not like oh i have to help other people <laughs> you know it's like you want to be a benefit it brings you so much so the increasing the flourishing of that and then the dwindling the trickling of the the floodgates that feed the separate sense of self that minimizes And you see this in the Dharma communities. I swear, I grew up around the Dharma. I, I swear to God. I, my parents helped found a Dharma center in Encinitas in the 70s and 80s, and they dragged me there as a little kid. And most of the people who went to this Dharma center were absolutely off their rockers. I mean, I mean, there were a lot of good people too, but I remember the kooky people. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I never... You know, and part of the thing that, that was so unattractive to me, even as a kid, because, you know, kids know, kids are s smart and they see things, is the, the, the posturing, the holier than thou. Oh, I've got my Dharma outfit. Oh, I've got my mala. Oh, I've got my mantra. And the ego that can get inflated and the tendencies, the insecurities that then can be masked by that. For me, I, I swore I would never be a part of any Dharma community, any Sangha ever. Like I was, I was basically revolting against all of that until I had the coming to Buddha moment and <laughs> needed some help. And then really found my teacher, Lama Tsultrim, who had created a brilliant community that was very much about emotional intelligence as well as spiritual growth. That's what for me was missing in those other communities that I grew up with. People would be assholes so that they could be first in line to get blessings for the Lama. You know, it's that kind of thing. Now, having said that, when I lived in Dharamsala in North India, where the Dalai Lama has his government in exile, when I was 23, I went and lived in Dharamsala for a year. And that's a huge community of refugee, Tibetan refugees coming to live near the Dalai Lama, to study with him, to receive his blessing. And every once in a while, the Dalai Lama would come out of his compound and give a teaching or hand out some little blessing pills or give refuge ceremony and so on. And I'll tell you what, those elder Tibetan women, those grandmas were tough. They would push and shove and do anything to get to the front so that they could get their blessing pills from the Dalai Lama, you know, so I remember thinking, okay, that's funny. This is everywhere, you know, and I would always be like, yes, you deserve to be. Yeah, absolutely. This white woman does not need to be first in line. <laughs> you go. <laughs> you know? Okay. So that's my uh, side tangent. 
Now, what I started thinking about with this slogan is the humility, you know, the beauty of humility, such a great quality. And when, you know, when we're in service to others, there is a feeling of a groundedness, like we walk on the earth, we know where we stand. And it's also uplifting and it has a positive effect in our, on our mood, on our life, our self um, you know, image, who we are. And it is this humble stance that Lo Jong helps us to cultivate and actually enjoy. It's not a chore, right? To be a benefit, to be a good person. So we don't need to puff ourselves up with accolades or pride when we're a Lo Jong practitioner. Um, and think about the people in your life, the humble people, especially those who are actually accomplished and have every right to brag about what they've done or who they are, especially when those people are humble. It's, it's really poignant. And maybe, you know, in a way, it's the people who don't feel good and who they are that feel that they need to puff themselves up and brag. It's the people who have kind of know who they are and you know achieved their sense of purpose they then they finally feel like okay i can relax i don't need to be that anymore i don't need to brag I don't need to do that and they carry themselves with a quality of wisdom that that inspires others so we can all be that we can be that so then i googled some great quotes about humility and i want to share a few that i liked with you this is the first one is from C.S. Lewis. He said, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. <laughs> That's worth posting in the chat. The next one is pride makes us artificial and humility makes us real by Thomas Merton, which I, when I read that, I said that that's true. That's true. I'll post the, the, all of these in a minute. Then the last one, I think this is the last one, yeah, is from Alice Walker. She said, thank you is the best prayer that anyone could say. I say that one a lot. Thank you expresses extreme gratitude, humility, and understanding. So now I'll just wrap up as promised. You know, first, and then I wanted to ask you guys, like, how do you stay humble? How do you remind yourself each day of your place in the world while still pursuing excellence, right? So like, how do you stay grounded, but also push your edge for the right reasons. And how do you stay humble? You can think about that. You could chat it in. Happy to see your chats if you chat it in. And I just wanna to touch on this other aspect of if we go with the don't wallow and self pity version of the translation, then we can understand this as an invitation as one of the one Dharma teacher named Judy Leaf says, Self-pity is simply a distraction and an energy drain. If someone is better off than you, who cares? If you are better off than someone else, who cares? She says, why make a fuss in either case? Instead of wallowing in your own fascination, either with being special or not getting what you deserve, you could practice thinking of others for a while. And then she suggests a, a simple practice, which is, you know, we expect so much from the world and from other people. And when those expectations are not met, we feel angry or sorry for ourselves. Maybe not all of you do, but sometimes we do, maybe. Oh, you know, I notice I feel that way with traffic. I definitely feel like the world owes me better traffic. <laughs> so, Think about in your own life, notice the kinds of expectations you have and the relationship between those expectations and the arising of disappointment and self-pity. See that cause and effect. You know, and then remember to come back to the breath. 
and recognize, you know, the world doesn't owe me anything. Why do I think the world owes me anything? Being born in this body didn't come with a guarantee slip, <laughs> you know. So, you know, Tibetan people, many left their homeland. That wasn't guaranteed for them. The Tibetans I met, some were angry, you know, but most of them were grateful to be alive, to be around His Holiness the Dalai Lama, to, to have the freedom to practice the Dharma. The most beautiful experience of my life was being in community with the Tibetan refugee community. It taught me so much about this. Yeah, even those grandmas <laughs> pushed me out of the way, you know? So thank you for your chats, everyone. And um, I, we're at time. I want to respect your evening. So let's take a moment to just dedicate for the benefit of ourselves and others this practice. May it bring benefit in some way. May we deepen our lojong and really walk our talk with it and help make the world a better place with humility. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'll probably see you next week. I think I'm on for next week, and then Eve will be here on the 13th. Take care. Be well.